biologists need to know what animals do if they're going to save them. Are those animals social or solitary? How much space do they need and how? Many mates do they have? Sometimes you can't predict the outcome of the research. Fernando Notbohm started out being interested in how birds know what to sing. Yet his research eventually led to a complete overhaul of the entire field of neurobiology, a totally unanticipated yet utterly monumental effect. And this is the course textbook by John Alcock the fact that this is in its ninth edition tells you how fast in a field animal behavior is. There are lots of new developments. Actually, a woman in the class I'm teaching at Sydney at the moment, a career woman, expressed this very nicely, although she was talking about something else, she was distinguishing expertise from authority. And certainly linguists because of our training we do have expertise in certain very narrow areas of language, but we don't have the authority over what to do with that knowledge or what to do with other knowledge that the community produces. I guess for me the bottom line is languages are lost because of the dominance of one people over another. That's not rocket science, it's not hard to work that out. But then what that means is if in working with language revival we continue to hold the authority, we actually haven't done anything. Towards undoing how languages are lost in the first place, so in a sense the languages are still lost if the authority is still lost. The sound of a cracking knee isn't particularly pleasant, but it gets worse when you listen up close. Knee cracking recording, it does for most people. But for me, it actually just makes me excited. Omer Inan, an electrical engineer at Georgia Tech, I actually feel like there's some real information in them that can be exploited for the purposes of helping people with rehab. Inan's experience with cracking knees goes back to his days as an undergrad at Stanford, where he threw discus. If I had a really hard workout, then the next day, of course, I'd be sore, but I'd also sometimes feel this catching or popping or creaking every now and then in my knee. A few years later, he found himself building tiny microphones at a high-end audio company. So when he got to Georgia Tech and heard the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, wanted better tech for knee injuries, he thought, knee cracking recording why For centuries, boys were top of the class. But these days, that's no longer the case. 
A new study by the OECD, a club of mostly rich countries, examined how 15-year-old boys and girls performed at reading, mathematics, and science. Boys still score somewhat better at maths, and in science the genders are roughly equal. But when it comes to the students who really struggle, the difference is stark. Boys are 50% more likely than girls to fall short of basic standards in all three areas. Researchers suggest that doing homework set by teachers is linked to better performance in maths, reading, and science. Boys, it appears, spend more of their free time in the virtual world. They are 17% more likely than girls to play collaborative online games than girls every day. They also use the internet more. Third, peer pressure plays a role. You can see that the two charts, each give quite a different picture of the performance of boys and girls in the two key subjects of math and English. It shows that in English, girls consistently outperform boys over a period of six years, achieving scores about 10% above their male peers. There is quite a different picture when we look at the math results with no real difference between genders in the results. What is the explanation for these key differences? To answer this question, Researchers look at biological and cognitive factors, and a range of social factors. The interaction between these different components in early childhood development are seen as maintained and reinforced in the school context. And this leads to distinct gender patterns of behavior and skills with direct consequences for school performance and achievement. The ultimate uses of this evidence are to show that biological factors, such as patterns of cognitive developments are A tragedy for the chicken and its closest relatives, but I don't think there was much possibility of us fearing a global pandemic and the deaths of millions. 20 or 30 years ago, if a bank in North America lent too much money to some people who couldn't afford to pay it back and the bank went bust, that was bad for the lender and bad for the borrower, but we didn't imagine it would bring the global economic system to its knees for nearly a decade. This is globalization. This is the miracle that has enabled us to transship our bodies and our minds and our words and our pictures and our ideas and our teaching and our learning around the planet ever faster and ever cheaper. It's brought a lot of bad stuff, like the stuff that I just described, but it's also brought a lot of good stuff. A lot of us are not aware of the extraordinary successes of the Millennium Development Goals, several of which have achieved their targets long before the due date. That proves that this species of humanity is capable of achieving extraordinary progress if
At the top, you would have a king. Now the king would rule over a kingdom. Now, this is not so easy to govern especially during the Middle Ages. And the king might owe many people, things especially people who helped the king come to power, helped him dispose the previous king or to conquer this land. And so in exchange for that and to help govern, he might grant land or feasts to other people. And the key currency in the Middle Ages under the feudal system island. And land in exchange for loyalty and service. So this whole thing is a kingdom. Now right over here, this is a duchy. And a duchy will be controlled by a duke. I guess I didn't call it ducky because that just doesn't sound as serious. So the king might grant a duchy, a duchy to a duke and in exchange, the duke would provide loyalty pledge their fealty. If the kingdom is threatened, the duke will fight alongside. The king would provide their own. I understand your professor has been discussing several Eastern Woodland Indian tribes in your study of Native American cultures. As you have probably all learned, the Eastern Woodland Indians get their name from the forest-covered areas of the Eastern United States where they lived. The earliest woodland cultures date back 9,000 years, but the group we'll focus on dates back only to about 700 AD. We now call these Native Americans the Mississippian culture, because they settled in the Mississippi River Valley. This civilization is known for its flat-topped monuments called temple mounds. They were made of earth and used as temples and official residences. The temple mounds were located in the central square of the city, with the huts of. The townspeople built in rows around the plaza. The Mississippian people were city dwellers. But some city residents earned their living as farmers, tending the fields of corn, beans, and squash that surrounded the city. When Australians engage in debate about educational quality or equity, they often seem to accept that a country cannot achieve both at the same time. Curriculum reforms intended to improve equity often fail to do so because they increase breadth or differentiation in offerings in a way that increases differences in quality. Further, these differences in quality often reflect differences in students' social backgrounds because the new Offerings are typically taken up by relatively disadvantaged students who are not served well them. Evidence from New South Wales will be used to illustrate this point. The need to improve the quality of education is well accepted across OECD and other countries as they seek to strengthen their human capital to underpin their modern, knowledge economies. Improved equity is also important for this purpose since the demand for high-level skills is widespread and the opportunities for the low-skilled are diminishing improved equity in education
similar pattern of wide and narrow range just like that barcode. We get to the point where we can just look across samples okay there's 1580 and there's 1735. We know where those difficult years are we able to look at the records in the rings. And from that reconstruct streamflow much further back than we can just with historical records in some areas under the best conditions were the best species we can have up to 10,000 years record from tree rings. We have maybe 5,200 years historical records from the rivers around here. We have trees and go back several hundred years. If you look at the Weaver River, we have about 100 years of record. To gives us a rough idea of how long droughts of Benin have severely been but it's only 100 years record and the trees have been around for 6 or 700 or more years, how can they give us a much longer record of those droughts? Sometimes as we look in the tree rings we see droughts that are much longer, much more severe than anything we see in the